lots of place in front. Mm -hmm. Thank you, colleagues, for having uh, been courageous enough to, uh, to find the for snow and definitely uh, attracted by the and the speaker of today. It's a great honor and pleasure to have with us Sir Graham Watson. Uh, he has been, uh, as you may know, uh, during four terms uh, in the European Parliament. So it's 20 years in the European Parliament. He has been uh, leading the alliance of uh, uh, liberal and democrats for Europe. Uh, it's a great honor to have you again here. So it's just sometime with the pleasure that uh, our union uh, will be the uh, European Civil Service uh, Federation to have you uh, talking on the various facets of the, uh, of the same subject. We, we were there just before the referendum of 2016, just after, to analyze the impact. Of, uh, and, and now it makes uh, 18 months more. Many events occur then. Uh, and even the timing for our conference is, I believe, perfect, as we, uh, we will monitor that uh, there is some kind of uh, an, an agreement, at least on the first phase of the negotiation. Which uh, make our conference tema very, uh, very timely uh, to discuss on your views on what should be next and what kind of form uh, the EU-UK uh, relation uh, could develop. So um, uh, I believe all the colleagues here are not here to listen to me. I'll try to do. <laughs> I want immediately next to the floor. Thank you, uh, Pierre Philippe. It's very kind of you to invite me for a third time. My wife always says to me that she will take me anywhere twice, but the second time is normally to apologize for the first. Um, I, I'm extremely grateful to you for your, your generous words of introduction. You make me sound like a distinguished politician. Actually, I'm an extinguished politician. Um, I sit these days on the European Economic and Social Committee, uh, which is proof of the saying that the best of chambers, sorry, that the worst of chambers is better than the best of antechambers. Um, it's great fun to, to sit down. Um, Ich weiß nicht, auf welche Sprache Sie wollen, dass ich heute rede. Vielleicht nicht auf der weit verbreitetsten Muttersprache unserer Union, sondern auf Englisch. Um, and, uh, if you will allow me, I will continue in what might be um, a language uh, threatened uh, with extinction in Brussels uh, in the near future, unless either the Maltese or the Irish decide to cling to it. Um, what can I say about um, Brexit? I'm not as gloomy as some. I think it is difficult to see how it can be stopped in the United Kingdom because you have a governing party which sees the European Union <coughs> as some kind of socialist plot and you have the leader of the opposition which sees the European Union as some kind of capitalist conspiracy. Um, and that is partly the difficulty that we're in, even if, as it is said, there is a majority in the House of Commons against leaving the European Union, the political system that the UK has does not allow that majority to express itself. And the European Union Withdrawal Bill is currently going through Parliament in London. Uh, there are another three days of debate in the House of Commons. Um, there are amendments down to it, uh, such as Amendment 124, which would allow the United Kingdom to decide to stay in the single market. But it's not at all clear that these amendments will get through. So it's difficult to see how Brexit can be stopped, but at the same time it's even more difficult to see how it can happen, because it is such a nonsense. The problems are already appearing. Uh, there are crops that are rotting in farmers' fields because there are no migrant workers to 
pick them. Uh, the OECD reports that the United Kingdom now has the slowest growing economy in the European Union. Inflation is above 3% and real incomes have fallen by over 2% in the last year uh, alone. Thousands of extra civil servants, and this should be a good message in this room, thousands of extra civil servants have been taken on to manage Brexit, and some three billion pounds has been set aside to manage the costs of it. You know, for that you could have 66,000 extra teachers and 70,000 extra police officers, which some people say the UK needs. Foreign direct investment is down from a £120 billion surplus in the first half of last year to a £25 billion deficit in the first half of this year. In the last 12 months, European banks have divested £350 billion worth of UK assets because they think that the UK economy is about to go into nosedive and there are forecasts 75,000 job losses in the city of London and up to 200,000 in the pharmaceutical and life science sector. I can give you far more examples of how Brexit is damaging the United Kingdom's economy. That's probably not the area where people will feel it first. They will feel it first in the way it's hitting public services, not just in the Not just in the fact that the cost of Brexit means we're not getting the investment in schools and police forces and health service that was otherwise could have been there, but that we can no longer get the staff. There was a report from the Nursing and Midwifery Council uh, a couple of weeks ago that said there's been a 90% drop in the number of continental nurses going to work in the United Kingdom, plus a 70% rise in the number of continentals leaving jobs in the health service. And then you've got the other social problems, the rise in hate crime. There's three times as many hate crimes reported in the UK now uh, as there were in a year ago. So there are all kinds of impacts of Brexit that are already being felt and one might reasonably say this nonsense cannot go ahead. Then look at where we actually are at the moment. Uh, you have uh, a bill going through Parliament, you have the Cabinet scheduled to have its first discussion next Tuesday as to what then what Britain wants as an alternative to full membership of the Union. This may seem incredible, but the British government has not yet discussed in Cabinet what it sees as an alternative to full membership of the European Union. That comes next Tuesday. You have decisions this week. There will be a, a motion voted in the European Parliament tomorrow, which will give the green light to the opening of the second phase of negotiations. And there will be a draft council conclusion, or so there will be a council conclusion at the end of this week, which foresees a future for the European Union outside of the single market and the customs union, which is what the United Government has told its partners in council that it is aiming for. Now, I think probably wisely, the Sherpas to the heads of state and government have decided that they should not adopt negotiating guidelines for the second phase of talks until the summit in March. In other words, they are allowing for a period to see whether the United Kingdom really is serious about going ahead uh, before they adopt negotiating guidelines. But there is a situation where a decision must be taken in the United Kingdom and it is rather like the proverbial story of the frog in the pan of water. I'm sure you all know it. You put a frog in a pan of cold water, you put it on heat, you heat it very slowly, and the frog is boiled alive. If you take the frog and you drop him straight into a pan of boiling water, he jumps out again. So, what happens? 
Oceans is the water at the moment so acceptable in temperature that the British public are not going to object to it. They will just be slowly boiled alive as we go along. If you read uh, the former Deputy Prime Minister and the former leader of the party which I belong to, the Liberal Democrats, Nick Clegg, also I'm pleased to say a former Commission official, writing in the Financial Times a few days ago, said that there will be no meaningful final vote in the British Parliament because all that Parliament will be asked to agree to is a heads of agreement. You know, that there is not going to be time in the period between now and the end of March 2019 to work out what any future trading relationship and other relationship would contain, there will simply be time to agree what the parameters of that relationship are. And if that is all the Parliament is asked to vote on, then there's probably going to be no great pressure on our parliamentarians to throw the whole thing out. You will get what has been called an enabling Brexit. Now you have the European Affairs Minister, David Davis, talking about CETA plus, plus, plus. But the reality is you can't have a CETA plus, plus, plus. You either have a Norwegian situation or you have a CETA. There's not much of it. The problem is that the UK economy is dominated by services. Altogether, um, in 2016, we benefited to the tune of over £75 billion pounds from our trade in services, over half of which is to other countries within the European Union. And that is where fundamentally we are. The government has managed to kick the can down the road, as they say, but at some point they will have to decide what they want, whether they want to remain effectively within the single market through perhaps a third pillar in the EEA or whether they wish to break completely from the single market and the customs union, which is what they are talking about at the moment. It's not very much help to say well, they set out to do one thing, saying that everything would be easy. They've ended up having to surrender eight months ago. 52% wanted to leave, approximately, and 48% to stay. Now, 52% want to stay and 48% want to leave. But they've not moved any further than that because people have not yet felt the damage that Brexit is doing and will do further. And so you could foresee a situation where, as predicted, things proceed. We have an agreement before March of 2019, and the UK is outside the European Union and trying to negotiate a Canada type. I was trying to find <coughs> examples in history of countries willingly doing themselves that kind of damage. You know, countries can screw up. Think of Russia in 1917. Think of Germany in 1933. In British history, I think there's probably not any evidence of such a great case of self-inflicted harm since George III gave away America over a tax on tea. But there's nothing to say it can't happen again. At the same time, given that we know that the economy is suffering, given that we know that people did not vote to be poorer, one must assume that something will happen that will cause them to throw the rascals out and start again. If there is one silver lining on this cloud, 
it is probably that the British people will be better informed about the European Union than at any time since 1973. I think, Chair, that's tout ce que je veux dire pour commencer, mais je suis prêt à répondre à vos questions en anglais, en français, or in Italian. <laughs> Maybe you can explain a bit further what what may mean uh, an next referendum that has been uh, agitated some days ago and possible transition between 2019 and 21. What is your view on this? And that's just that I mean, for colleagues in your to some more questions. But maybe you could give up in the time. Well, we sorry. we we have 473 days to go. And for the next 20 or so, they're not going to be doing very much. Um, but the clock is ticking, as Michel Barnier likes to say. Um, and the United Kingdom will have to agree. The government will have to agree what they want. And then they will have to try to negotiate the best deal they can with the other 27 to allow for that to happen. Will they put the whole thing to a vote of the British people at the end of it? They might, but I think it's unlikely. I think they will, will put it to a vote in Parliament. And I think because it will be an empty shell of an agreement, Parliament will probably vote it through. If they were to put it to the British people, would they agree or not? Very hard to tell very hard to know how quickly the economic um, problems will be felt and some of the social problems uh, that it is causing. Um, one thing I think is absolutely clear uh, and that is that we have seen just how very shaky the government is over this when we had to deal with the question of Northern Ireland border. Uh, the Conservative Party does not have a majority in the House of Commons. It relies on a rather curious bunch of people uh, representing the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland in order to get it through. And it relies on some ideas which perhaps have not been properly examined. Uh, the T-shirt of the Republic of Ireland said, you don't seem to have thought this through. And I think many people would agree. Yeah. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. And to bring light on any of your queries. We'll start. Um, when you said there could be a referendum, uh, the people could be asked to vote. Um, the thing is, Britain is out anyway on the 29th of March. So, how can we have a referendum before that date? It's, it's not possible. So, even if you had a referendum and people said 52, 48 to stay, we're already out. Yeah, I mean, it depends, it depends of course, on, on how the thing runs. But if we assume that the heads of state and government on Friday, uh, as their Sherpas have suggested, that they will adopt the negotiating guidelines for the future relationship in March of this year. They then have, according to Michel Barnier, effectively only six months in which to negotiate, because he is saying you need an agreement by October of 2018 uh, in order to um, tie the whole thing up by March of 2019. Now, it's pos possible that the UK government would put that agreement, assuming it does happen by October of 2018, or even by the end of 2018, that the UK government would put that deal to the people in a referendum sometime in the first three months of 2019. But it seems unlikely, because unless there is sufficient public pressure for a referendum, or unless something has gone badly wrong in Parliament, the government maybe think they wouldn't win a vote in Parliament and decide to go to the people instead. I don't know. All kinds of scenarios are possible. 
Um, as Harold Wilson said, a week in politics is a long time. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to have a lot more fun with this one yet. To those of us who are Brits, we're going to have a lot more embarrassment with this one yet uh, as we go along. But, you know, I mean, today, from somewhere in French Guiana, we are firing another four satellites into space, part of the Galileo system. Does the United Kingdom really want to be outside all of the developments that we're having? Given how many United Kingdom <coughs> companies have a serious interest in developments in, in, in astrophysics, you know, is the United Kingdom really going to decide to be outside all kinds of other agencies and work of the European Union? That is what the UK government is talking about at the moment. It's talking about being outside the governance of the United uh, of the European Union. Whether, in the end, that will be their position remains yet to be seen, and there is still a fight going on between those members of the cabinet who want to remain in the single market and the customs union, and those members of the cabinet who want to be out. And there is talk today in London about Theresa May having a government reshuffle uh, early in the new year. So she may have her own opinions on this and she may conduct her ministerial reshuffle uh, in conjunction with those. But it is quite amazing that we've reached this point and we still don't know for sure either what the Prime Minister wants or what the Leader of the Opposition wants. That's where we are. Perfidious Albion. <laughs> I wouldn't say so. If you say anything. Did you hear me now? Yes. I have one uh, comment and one question. Uh, one comment as a, as a Brit and as a European, might I add. Um, I find it deeply frustrating. I think one, even though it's all played out, let's face it, the UK leaving the EU is actually a disaster not just for the UK, but for the EU as well. It's not a minor thing, it's a big thing, and it's a failure. And I'm deeply frustrated that um, perhaps we British colleagues in the institutions haven't been good enough at explaining why this has happened. This is not something that's happened because of something overnight. This is all to do with all sorts of things deeply rooted in the British psyche. Post-imperial neurosis, British exceptionalism, all the rest of it. And I think people here need to understand the British psyche a lot more. We have failed to communicate the EU successfully to the UK, and we're not doing it very well elsewhere either. So I think we really need to get our act together. It's not good enough. That's my comment. We can't be too complacent there. Um, the second point I want to ask Graham, if I may, was, um, as we know, the trade agreement is going to be much more tricky than the, the first part, because not all the other states are going to be affected in the same way. Ireland, the Netherlands, Flanders in particular are going to be very hard, badly hit. So you may well get all sorts of infighting and differences of opinion between the member states. So how do you think that might play out? I, I, I think it's a very interesting question. Is you know one tends, particularly perhaps as a Brit, to look at what's happening in London um, and to agonise about future of the UK, um, perhaps we're not paying very much attention to what's happening on the continent. And I think as a European, and as somebody who has no difficulty whatsoever with a sense of overlapping identity, I am a Scot, I am a Brit, I am a European, and I am a global citizen. Um, and I regret that not all of my compatriots feel comfortable in such skins. But I... I, I think we do overlook the damage that will be done to the European Union uh, and perhaps the damage that will be done to the European Union at a time when the United Kingdom is not the only problem by any means. I mean, what is happening in Poland is still worrying. Uh, the way Hungary is going is worrying. Greece has still not sorted out its problems and there are many other member states where there are reasons for quite serious concern. The unity of the 27, which, to give credit to Michel Barnier, who is a, an accomplished politician, he has worked very hard to build and to maintain, uh, it will not necessarily hold in the year of talks to come. And I'm 
sure there will be pressure on different governments, probably first of all the governments of Belgium and the Netherlands, since their economies are more closely linked to the UK's than any member state bar Ireland. And in Ireland's case, there are historical reasons um, for, for not stopping it. But I, I think we could see things become very difficult in Belgium and in the Netherlands. Not so much, I think, in Germany, because I think the German automobile industry has accepted always and will accept that the politics are more important than the economics. Um, and I think that Germany is one of the few extremely well-functioning countries within the European Union um, who will probably remain of their current view with regard to Brexit, i.e. we regret that the Brits are leaving, but that's their choice and we respect their democratic decisions. Um, but will that, will that unity, will the unity that's been there hold? That's anybody's guess. Um, your, your liberal colleague, uh, Hugh Hofstadt, has, um, well, he's been doing lots of really good things, but uh, he's uh, floated this idea of um, associate uh, EU citizenship. Um, do you think that will ever fly? No, I think it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the treaties, actually. There's no way legally you can do it. I mean, I, I, I think he is brilliant. Um, in some ways, he's more Italian than he is Belgian. You know? <laughs> I mean, if he lost an arm, he'd be speechless. Um, he, uh, I think he's brilliant with coming up with ideas, but I mean, it, it's, it, it's a lovely sounding idea. But when you actually look at it legally, how it works, it's quite impossible. Um, but but I you know I, I welcome the creativity and I think if we had a bit more creativity uh, in the European Union it, it, it would be it would be a good thing. No, I think what is what is fascinating about Brexit is is actually the way in which you realise more and more the implication. I mean, do you, I, Einstein uh, said, as the circle of light grows so too does the circumference of darkness. And I think that's right. You know, the more we understand about Brexit, the more we understand are the uncertainties surrounding it. And that is where I think we're going to have a very interesting, albeit desperately exhausting, discussion uh, across the European Union about the whole idea. Um, one thing I've never really understood is why, in the run-up to the referendum, British business didn't take more leadership and, you know, w was quite placid, really, uh, in speaking out against Brexit. I've never understood that. Just in your thoughts on that. Um, if you want to understand the English psychology on this, there is a Catholic priest who became a fairly noted poet, uh, a man by the name of G.K. Chesterton. Uh, and he has a poem called The People of England, to which the chorus line goes, smile at us, pay us, pass us, but never quite forget that we are the people of England who have not spoken yet. And the final verse, it changes, that we are the people of England who have never spoken yet. And I think there's something in that. You know, the business community, who had every interest in there being an informed debate in the run-up to the referendum, simply did not get off its seat to do anything about it. Uh, and it's a great shame. Now, if you look at what are the things that could stop Brexit happening, you know, you are beginning to see business leaders standing up. The man who runs the Honda factory in Swindon, recently said, look, if you guys are coming out of the customs union, we are not going to be investing any more in our factory in Swindon. It's beginning to happen. Every day there are reports coming out. There was uh, today a report from Manpower that showed that business confidence is at a five-year low. There was another report came out late last night from Rand Europe that showed that Brexit is 
bad for the UK economy in every possible way. You know, they couldn't find a single area of the economy where Brexit would uh, improve things. But none of this is big enough on its own. You need something that's going to really grasp the public imagination. Now, you can imagine, for example, uh, since the airlines are the first to be hit by a country not being in the European Union, because unless over 50% of the shares are held within the European Union and you are headquartered in a European Union member state, you don't have the right to fly. So what's going to happen, British Airways, through International Airlines Group, which it shares with Iberia, will change its shareholding structure and it will move its headquarters to the big new corporate headquarters which International Airlines Group is currently building in Spain. But will they say anything about it? Now, you know, if Willie Walsh was the head of Ryanair and Michael O'Leary was the head of British Airways, then we'd already know about it and perhaps we would have stopped Brexit already. <laughs> but Willie Walsh is very English and he's just not going to stand up and say that. So, you know, unless there's something that hits people in a way that really makes them think, good God, if this is what Brexit is about, we don't want it, then I'm not sure that public opinion in the UK will move far enough and fast enough to stop the whole thing happening. Thank you. Just, just on this uh, team, Mr. Watson, would you say that also the uh, UK trade unions are very English because they, they seem also themselves not to be perceived as particularly uh, uh, influential, anyway, active in this debate? Is it because as the business they are too involved in lobbying the members of the cabinet or they, they've decided to remain uh, a little bit apart? There was one point at the beginning of the summer, uh, actually it might have been at the end of the summer, when Jeremy Corbyn came out and, and said that he had, the Labour Party adopted a position uh, which made one think that they wanted to stay within the single market and the customs union. Um, and I'm told that this happened essentially because of pressure from Francis O'Grady, who is the Secretary General of one of the big trade unions. But the trade unions occupy a far less prominent role in British public debate than they did 20 years ago. I mean, you could say that Mrs. Thatcher broke the trade unions. In many ways, it's true. Not to say that they're not influential. They are influential. They are more influential with the Labour Party than with any other party. But even the extent to which they can decide Labour Party's policy <coughs> is, is doubtful. Moreover, within the trade union movement, there were some unions that supported Brexit and there were some that opposed it. So there is not unity within the movement. It's difficult for them to speak uh, with, with one voice. Uh, I, I think they can be powerful in pushing Labour into a position where it might decide at least to stay within the single market of the customs union as far as possible. But unless public opinion is changing very fast, I guess we won't see any further movement in the Labour Party on that, which is a pity. Um, Jeremy Corbyn probably fundamentally has not changed his mind on this very much since the 1975 referendum when it is said that he voted to come out. Uh, he was asked a question at a meeting in Yorkshire uh, about 10 days ago if there were a vote, another vote today, which way would you vote? And he said he would vote to stay in. But, you know, it seems as if he's waiting to see which way public opinion is moving. And maybe if public opinion is moving in favor of staying in, and Jeremy Corbyn believes that this will take him into number 10 Downing Street, then he will become in favor of staying in. But we're not there yet. But we're a long way away from it. Thank you very much, Sir Graham, for uh, your presentation. I think the best thing that one can say about Brexit is that it does provide more excellent presentations such as this and for very, very exciting television. Um, I'm trying to follow uh, everything as, as best I can on the Marshall with the Zeta plus 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 and some of the politics and, uh, um, and uh, your presentation.
session did indeed um, uh, confirm the overall picture that one guesses uh, that uh, um, the UK is in at, at, at present. Um, which um, I have a, a comment and a question, if you don't mind. Uh, my, um, my comment uh, is um, partly, uh, I, bet, I spent the better part of 10 years dealing with uh, internal market access uh, of the, um, the EFTA contracts. And until news night last night, um, Switzerland hadn't been very prominent in the debate. And I actually got quite sick to my stomach, to be frank, when when that came up because the, the, the Swiss, uh, I know everybody's speaking about a bespoke deal for the UK, and uh, but um, you know, like you said, if if if, uh, if you're going to negotiate something um, in the period available, it has to be based on something, and. Um, to the uh, countries in the uh, European economic area, we always said that nobody would ever get an agreement with the same uh, um, kind of access under the same conditions because uh, the EA agreement was negotiated as a step towards membership. Then it, it, it happened that uh, Norway fell out, but, uh, but uh, so they retained um, the advantages of, of the EA agreement, and it uh, it has its swings in the ground, its roundabout, but it, it works and it's reasonably effective. Whereas the various sector agreements that we have with Switzerland are a complete nightmare. Uh, they demand an awful lot of resources. There are about I think 117 um, subcommittees to the to the seven sector agreements that have been negotiated. It's not a dynamic procedure of uh, taking over the uh, key, it's a static one with a huge backup. Um, so if that's drawn into, I have this, um, this fear that you also hinted at, that um, uh, Michel Garnier's team uh, will be very much aware of, 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 of the risks of various elements of, of uh, possible whisper deal for the UK, um, but uh, what um, doesn't come through very much in, in the debate as far as I can follow it in, uh, in the UK um, is exactly what you said, that at some point um, member states uh, and the council will say, well, let's get this over and, and done with because we have these other big things coming up and, and uh, people uh, um, might forget about um, about these core principles that the Westerners have been trying to defend for the past 25 years. Um, uh, so that, that was the sort of the comment I, I, um, I wanted to, to make. The, 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 the question is, um, I do think the reporting of the state of affairs is reasonably good, uh, I mean, as good as it can be in, in the UK media. Uh, but if you uh, look precisely as, as um, you described it, uh, the, the very high level of analysis and information uh, that you can get if, um, if it's available contrary to the 58 sector papers. And, um, but, um, uh, it doesn't seem to, I mean, you have to either get up early on a Sunday morning or stay up till quarter past midnight to get this information, and it doesn't filter through to the, um, to the public opinion. Hence, I expect um, this big uh, difference between uh, the discussions amongst those who know more or less what we're talking about to the extent that they share it, because I noticed yesterday that even Shukaramuna was very careful about his wording, so he's sort of hedging his, his fence. Um, and, um, and then the understanding of, of uh, the public. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking uh, that um, I noted uh, Nick, Nick Clegg stressed uh, a long time ago that if there were a referendum, um, it wouldn't be a 
second re referendum on the principle of leading Brexit, uh, where I totally agree with my colleague there that that was probably based on this perceived uh, influence of Europe in in um, in the UK. But it would be a, a first referendum of, on an, on an actual deal where where you would be able to uh, to analyse all the you know, if, if people were willing to to, uh, to to look at the details, you could actually see the, the, the consequences. Um, um, but what would your question? <laughs> yes, well, uh, my question is: um, Do you think that in that situation um, it would be possible, or conceivable, for uh, to have a campaign that? Um, would make the electorate actually have a reasonable grasp on on the consequences of Brexit, Brexit for them and for their daily lives. And sorry, just uh, uh, not on that page. I wouldn't worry too much about the the, the Article 50 deadline because uh, I've been in enough negotiations to know that if everybody agrees that that. Uh, there will be a referendum, I'm sure, that uh, the Parliament can hold off the referendum the ratification or so, whenever. So. <laughs> on, on your question, um, may I break all the rules of politics and give you a completely honest answer? <laughs> um, I actually think that if we had a second referendum, it would be a lot better. I think enough people now know what is at stake to have a better finance and a better informed campaign run by those who believe that we should stay within the European Union. And it comes back to Susanna's question about British business. I think the business community would take a second referendum campaign much, much more seriously. But equally, I think it's very difficult to see how we get into a second referendum campaign. We may not have that luxury. I, I loved your phrase, um, about the UK for politics, where you said those who know more or less what they're talking about. I mean, unfortunately, that's where we are. You know, even with people who are, you know, serious front bench spokespersons in their respective parties, and this even applies to the party of which I'm a member, it, sometimes you realize that they have delved deeply into the surface of, <laughs> of, of the matter. I mean, there is really not an understanding of how the European Union works, because there has never been that kind of depth of debate in UK Parliament and in UK society that you have had in other member states. And this is reflected in the fact that, you know, a member of the European Parliament does not have a, a right to enter the Palace of Westminster uh, other than going in as, as, as a guest. You know, you have to queue up and get a pass. Your pass no longer allows you to get in. It did at one time. Anymore. There, are, there are no debates where you bring together, or no parliamentary debates, where you bring together members of the national parliament with members of the European parliament, which you do in the Trade Kammer in the Netherlands, which you do in the Senat in France, and, and in, in other um, chambers uh, elsewhere. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe the best that we will be able to get is some kind of EFTA, European Economic Area, situation. The Norwegians understandably don't want the United Kingdom back in EFTA, but there's quite an interesting idea being worked up by a group of lawyers in Brussels and in London on creating a third pillar for the European Economic Area, or for EFTA, where, into which the UK would sit uh, and would then effectively be subject to European law be done through the EFTA court rather than through the Court of Justice, but could remain within the single market and the customs union. But, you know, it may be that is, um, that is the, 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 the best that we're going to get. But, but it is, you know, we do need to have a decision first from the cabinet as to what they want, what the government wants. Um, I remember somebody once saying to person who'd come to plead a case, they said, is your indecision final? <laughs> uh, I hope that the indecision in British government is not final. Uh, Mr. Watson, thank you for this interesting discussion. I learned a lot about the UK debate. I have a 
have also two questions and one remark. Uh, first question just goes back what has just been said. Do you believe that uh, discussion of a second referendum is thinkable in in the spirit of the UK constitutional tradition? Uh, we live, of course, in a, in, a, in times of everything is possible. If you believe that uh, this is possible, and I understand from your intervention so far that you consider that a better, more informed public debate is needed. We heard from your side quite a number of facts. Of course, these are figures. It's important to say what are the qu questions asked in all these economic studies. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a few weeks ago in Brussels, I attended a presentation of the Economist Intelligence Unit, where a different economic position was viewed, uh, notably that in the short term maybe Brexit is very bad for the UK economy and society, but in the long term it had the chances to balance and improve. But uh, this is very bad for the debate because up to 2020, um, this arguments are uh, quite, uh, quite facilitated by the logic of the economic cycle. Uh, so we will have different interventions. That we have really to inform people what we are talking about, what questions ask and what, the, what has been done. But in this line, of re one of reasoning I would like to ask you, do you believe that the European Union should be uh, more uh, involved in this debate? Because after Brexit, it has been quite passive in European institutions. Because I would also, and this I come with a short remark, uh, we heard about the Netherlands, we heard about uh, the uh, island, no doubt a country very much impacted, especially given the structure of its uh, agri-food industry. But there is also a different stories in Europe. Well, I'm from Bulgaria, in my home city, Burgas, which is the best uh, story of uh, EU success. Uh, I, it's been interesting to see that uh, the, top, uh, the number of uh, investing companies, actually not Russia, but UK, uh, this is a city which ran a lot of uh, um, uh, awards for the best place also to live in Bulgaria. Uh, the mayor last week announced that the port will uh, welcome investment from China with ambition to, to increase the import to Central and Eastern Europe. Maybe you ask this company whether they like to leave. Thanks. Uh, should, should the European Union be involved in the debate? Well, my answer would always be yes. You know, we always, I, I, I know that at the time of the referendum, the UK government was sending out signals to other governments and to the European Commission saying, please do not get involved in our debate. I regret the fact that people, you know, respected that wish. I mean, actually, everybody has a right to get involved in the debate because it affects us all. And if you share the view of, of the writer H.G. Wells, who says that the whole of human history becomes increasingly a race between education and catastrophe, then you have to be active. You have to get involved. And, and I actually think it would be very helpful in the United Kingdom if people from other countries who do understand how the European Union functions get involved. I, the, the case that I make, and, and I'm, I'm back to, and I spent a year in the run-up to the referendum and then six months afterwards fighting Brexit, and I did so much that I put myself into hospital for most of the first half of this year. Well, I'm now okay again, and I'm now back to spending most Thursday nights and Friday nights and Saturday nights speaking at public meetings up and down the UK, trying to stop Brexit happening, and Saturday mornings on street stalls, you know, trying to explain to people in shopping centres what was wrong. Uh, are we? Are we going to succeed in this? I don't know. But even if the chance of stopping is only 10%, I think it's worthwhile fighting for. Uh, and I think anybody who is prepared to put a bit of time in to try to do this, writing letters to British newspapers, coming over and talking uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, do. There is quite a big campaign going uh, to try to stop Brexit happening, um, and it's, it, it's doing the best, the best it can. Is the or is discussion of a second referendum possible? Well, discussion is, but I, I think it's unlikely that the government will concede to the second referendum. If the current government is thrown out, falls in one way or another, then it might happen. Personally, I have never favored referenda on any subject. Uh, I have an Italian wife. Thankfully for me, she provides my exit from Brexit, uh, my antidote to Brexit. But at the same time, I 
came to see how referenda were used in, Italy, in Italian politics throughout the 1980s and 1990s, and I don't think it was a very constructive way of having a political debate. Um, similarly, the increasing use of referenda in the United Kingdom has not helped to inform public debate. If you believe in a representative democracy, then you elect people and you rely on them to use their judgment in the knowledge of the facts that they receive uh, to make decisions uh, on, on your behalf. Um, and, and that's where we are. It is true, however, that there is not a huge amount of trust in the United Kingdom at the moment in the mechanisms of representative democracy. The story that I like, if I may share this with you, is the story that's told about Harold Acton, Lord Acton. Lord Acton became a minister in one of the post-war governments. Um, he was an aristocrat, a man of independent means. He didn't need to be there. Um, and he was complaining to one of his civil servants as he went into a meeting that he didn't know why he was going because he didn't understand the subject. And the civil servant said, Minister, that's precisely why you need to attend this meeting, cabinet committee. When he came out at the end, the civil servant said to him, Lord Acton, do you understand it now? Lord Acton said, well, I'm still confused, but at a much higher level. <laughs> I mean, I think there is a feeling in the United Kingdom that even some of those governing us don't really understand what they're doing. And it may not be entirely wrong. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Sue Bird from, um, I, I work for the Commission, um, DG Employment. And so, Graham, you, you referred to um, uh, possibly a shorter term economic downturn in the UK as a result of uh, Brexit. I think you were implying that. Um, now, I've heard at least one Brussels commentator suggesting that, um, you know, over time it's, the, the economic downturn will happen but it'll be something more gradual, shall we say, and that um, in due course um, it'll, be, it'll be so gradual that at the end of the day, ten years down the line, people will not notice. You know, of course, that's, that's a key point, um, because if there can be some um, uh, a taking on board of a perception that over time in the shorter term, you know, there may well be an economic downturn, which is felt by, um, uh, if I may refer to the rank and file electorate. Um, you know, that is one scenario, but if, if it isn't felt until the longer term, then certainly Brexit is going to happen, and certainly it will be down to, you know, at least another generation to decide, you know, the longer term future relationship with the UK with the European Union. So I just wondered if you could comment, you know, you, you implied uh, that it was that it could be shorter term, but then there's commentaries which say, well, no, the economic downturn is going to be longer term and maybe, you know, not, not, uh, not, sufficient, not sufficiently noticeable. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Well, I mean, those who practice the dismal science of economics, uh, of course, have many different views as to what's going to happen. I, I just see what's happening already. Um, I, I'm, I'm somehow a bit confused by the idea that comes out of things like the Economic Intelligence, Economist Intelligence Unit, you know, that, that in the medium to long term things will be much better. Firstly because, as Keynes pointed out, in the long term we're all dead. And secondly because the idea that somehow the United Kingdom outside the European Union will be more successful as a trading economy is not one that grips me. I mean, Germany does three times as much trade with the rest of the world as the United Kingdom does. It is not in any way restricted by its membership of the European Union. It is far more anchored in the European Union than the UK is. It has the Euro, it's part of Schengen, and so on and so forth. Uh, and yet, it is a very successful global trading, or has a very successful global trading economy. So I, I, I really don't see where this view favoured by some economists and some on the right, that the UK, freed from the shackles of EU membership, would suddenly be a much greater economy. I think what is far more likely, and what I'm sure the Brexiters want, is that the United Kingdom would become some kind of 
bargain basement economy with lower tax rates and lower environmental standards and lower social standards than are practiced on the continent, so it would gain a competitive advantage for a short while. But, you know, in one sense, the people who favor Brexit, the Michael Goves and the um, David Davises and the Liam Foxes, they are the true inheritors of Thatcherism. Because their real agenda, to my mind, is nothing to do with sovereignty. It has to do with cutting social standards and turning the UK's economy into something rather more like the economy of the United States of America than the economy of the European Union. And that's not the kind of future I want. Uh, or I believe the future that many people in the UK want. And I think if we manage to stop Brexit, it will be fundamentally for this reason. People did not vote to be poorer when they went to vote. And if they perceive that they're going to be poorer or worse off outside the European Union, then there's a chance that you mobilize them uh, into stopping it. Whether we can get there, I, I don't know. That's a million, very interesting. Um, do, you, do you see some responsibility from the Liberal Democratic Party uh, from the beginning of the history, the decision taken to uh, establish this referendum? Do you have some autocritics vis-à-vis of your Liberal Democratic Party? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that my party was not part of the decision. But do I have criticisms of my own party? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, the idea of a referendum has been around for a long time. Um, and my party has been perhaps not as bad as others, but there have been moments where we have said uh, in opposition, oh, uh, if such and such a treaty is adopted, we should have a referendum on it. Or where we've said, um, when there has been a proposal for a referendum on a treaty, as there was, for example, on the Lisbon Treaty, we said, uh, no, no, we don't think there should be a referendum on the treaty. If we're going to have a referendum at all, it should be on whether we stay within the European Union or not. You know, but all political parties in the United Kingdom have been swept along in this pressure for a referendum. And a bit of moral backbone wouldn't have been a bad thing. That makes me sound horribly conservative and authoritarian, <laughs> but um, I, 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 I do actually, uh, I do actually believe that. Um, I, I think while the referendum was called for by David Cameron uh, in a moment of weakness, um, frankly, if you followed the political debate that was going on in the United Kingdom over 25 years you would have reasonably come to the conclusion that at some point there was going to be a referendum. Hello, my name is Constance Litt. I work for DG Budget and I'm German. And first of all, let me say so what I think your assessment of the German uh, perspective on Brexit is quite correct. I would even uh, go to the point where I say there is a bit of a case of schadenfreude right now. Um, um, I read a couple of months back, I think, in The Economist, a suggestion um, that within the British government there is no fear um, when it comes to human capital being available in the UK because that could easily be rebalanced by attracting by, um, employees from the Commonwealth. And there is actually a plan to increase that. Um, what's your assessment of that? Well, well, it's a very interesting point because um, <coughs> it's now become clear that part of the campaign in the referendum that was carried out by the people who wanted us to leave, particularly in the West Midlands, where there is quite a high level of Commonwealth immigration, was in saying to people, well, if you vote for Brexit, we'll be able to stop all of these Eastern Europeans coming in, and we'll have to bring in Indians and Pakistanis instead so you can all have your family reunification. That was actually used as an argument in the campaign. Um, I think that argument was perhaps not used in the Shire counties of southwest England, for example, um, where it might not have had the same, uh, the same effect. Um, but it undoubtedly happened, and there were quite a lot of people from Commonwealth immigrant communities who voted in favour in favor of Brexit. But, you know, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time raking the coals of what I think was a very bad uh, referendum campaign right from the very beginning, uh, including the terms of reference and the franchise and a lot of other things. I think we are where we are, and we have to move on from here. I don't know what Michel
Michel Barnier has said uh, at the General Affairs Council this morning. He's probably holding a press conference right now uh, on, on what he told the European Affairs Ministers. But he will clearly have told them that we have moved already from phase one of the negotiations to phase two of the negotiations. Uh, and that we are now talking about the terms of the UK's future relationship with the European Union from the outside. Uh, if the UK is going to stop that, then it has to do it very quickly. It can do it by withdrawing the Article 50 letter any time between now and the 29th of March 2019. But to actually withdraw a letter takes a decision in politics and it takes an act. To not act is always an easier outcome to achieve. Listening to the arguments, I mean, one one can never, I think, really claim that uh, the solution along Norwegian, Swiss, or EFTA lines uh, is really taking back sovereignty. Uh, it's it's the worst outcome that could possibly have in terms of sovereignty. Um, but I also wonder whether there isn't there wasn't a hidden agenda behind the Brexiteers campaign. Uh, when you look at the work of uh, Roberto Saviano and you look at a uh, recent uh, BBC World documentary uh, on, in the wake of the Panama Papers, they basically concluded that London was the neuralgic centre of all money laundering activity uh, globally. And that when you look at, for example, the fact that UKIP were basically financed by a financier, um, is there not a hidden agenda there in terms of uh, what the real reasons are? Because it's clearly going to be no benefit whatsoever to ordinary Britons. They're going to lose in terms of um, their standard of living. Um, and on a more Scottish question, um, do you think that there is a possibility that there could be a... a, a a, a brighter future potentially for Scotland uh, out of the UK, but maybe back into the European Union. Just before you answer, because I see that some people are already actually working, working out, we'd like first to applause and to. If you still want to, uh, to, be, to be there, mm -hmm. you're available. 250. 250. I mean, that's. Or 250. Yeah. And um, please. Um, well, I, I, I won't comment on London. I think there are many money laundering centres in the world. London is certainly one of them, I've no doubt, but it's not the only one. Um, and um, and, uh, and I hope that uh, governments do become serious about tackling the problem, but I haven't seen the evidence of it really yet. Uh, I remember David Cameron in the early days of his presidency of the Union, I think at the Hampton Park Summit, calling a conference uh, of governments, heads of state and government, to fight money laundering because there had been some Panama Papers style uh, leak. Um, and this uh, special summit on money laundering subsequently took place. And as far as I'm aware, nothing happened. Um, and I regret that that is, is the case. But London, the city of London, will certainly be the first uh, and the biggest sufferer from Brexit. Um, and I'm surprised that more hasn't been done. But, you know, you talk about other agendas. I think, and I think this is very serious, there have been other agendas in this. There is no doubt that over a period of nearly 30 years, there was money coming from East Coast America into financing a campaign to get the United Kingdom out of the European Union. Now, I don't suggest this came from the American government. No, not at all. This came from the neocons working with the Heritage Foundation, deciding that Europe was really becoming a bit too powerful and that there might even be a danger that one day the euro would become the world's reserve currency rather than the dollar, uh, and what could be done to restrict the rise of Europe. Uh, and there was American money, lots 
actually, there is also evidence of some Russian money having come in and come in to finance Nigel Farage and his United Kingdom uh, Independence Party. So, I mean, there have undoubtedly been much wider forces at play. And if it was perceived that the EU, that the United Kingdom was the easiest country to detach from the European Union, perhaps that was a very perceptive um, uh, observation. Will it lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom? Well, I think what is interesting is really what happens. I suspect that if we stay within the single market and the customs union, there will be no pressure for a break of the United Kingdom. And if you look in detail at the agreement that was reached on the Northern Ireland question, this does actually allow for us to stay within the customs union. I mean, the, 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 the Declaration on Northern Ireland says that the UK, and I quote, remains committed to protecting North-South cooperation and avoiding a hard border. And it goes on to say, any future agreements must be compatible with those overarching requirements. And I think the phrase overarching requirements is an interesting one. Because what it means in the end is that Northern Ireland has to stay within the single market of the customs union one way or another. And so the question then becomes, does the rest of the United Kingdom stay in or not? And that is where I think the next um, big battle is going to be fought. I think that if the, the result of that battle is that the rest of the United Kingdom leaves the single market and the customs union while Northern Ireland stays, then you can envisage a breakup of the United Kingdom. Firstly, because the Democratic Unionist Party will think they've been tricked uh, by Theresa May. Uh, all the hell could be let loose in the province. Secondly, because Scotland will say, quite rightly, well, we voted to stay in. Why, if they can have it, why can we not? Gibraltar will say the same. The Welsh might. The vote in Wales was almost 50-50. Um, but, but I can then see the circumstances in which a United Kingdom outside the European Union starts to, to break up. And, you know, you've got to remember that a lot of comparisons are made between Scotland and Catalonia. But there is one fundamental difference. And that is that Scotland voted in 1707 to be part of the United Kingdom. It was a parliamentary procedure. You can argue that they were bribed. Yeah. You can argue that they had no choice because Scotland was bankrupt anyway after the Darien scheme. You know, you can make all kinds of arguments about what a parcel of rogues in a nation did in that vote in the Scottish Parliament. But Scotland did vote. And something that has been entered into voluntarily can also, by definition, be exited from voluntarily. Um, and I think that's where Scotland poses less of a problem to the rest of the Thanks for your presentation, Mr. Watson. Um, just one question about a topic that has not been raised so far, um, the elephant, so to speak, in the room. Um, you mentioned that um, the UK already has 25 years, or uh, basically right from the beginning onwards, in 1973, it's been uh, been coping with a Eurosceptic press and a Eurosceptic attitude. Now, how are you going to address this Eurosceptic <coughs> attitude among the British press? And let's call it by its name, how are you going to deal with Rupert Murdoch in this respect? Yeah. Well, you identify Rupert Murdoch as, as being, I think, the, the, the biggest obstacle and the biggest problem. Um, I'm told, uh, I've no, not independently verified this, that Rupert Murdoch's father, who was a big dairy and beef farmer in Australia, um, lost a huge amount of money when the United Kingdom joined the European Union because of the end of imperial preferences. Um, so he could no longer export his dairy products to the UK free of tariffs. Um, and, and, and that is the reason why Rupert Murdoch has been so anti-Europe all the way. But then as Rupert Murdoch himself has said, you know, if he wants to walk into number 10 Downing Street, they lay out the red carpet for him. If he wants to walk into the Berlin Mall, they don't even know who he is. Um, and, uh, and I think there's something in that in, in that as well. Um, but we have, we, we do 
do have a problem, and the problem is partly lack of knowledge about the European Union, um, but, but also greatly lack of sympathy towards it because it's never been properly explained. And I think that one of the difficulties here, um, and it's one that we all face every day, is how does one talk about the European Union? You know, when I go around the country at the moment, I'm talking about the economic pro um, cost of leaving. I'm talking to some extent about the social cost and the cost in public services as well, but fundamentally about the economic kind of cost. But I don't believe that the case for the European Union is an economic case in the slightest. I think the case for the European Union is utterly different, far larger, and far more noble. And it is the case for a more general global cooperation in, in trying to prevent war, because war is the single most destructive uh, act that, we, that humankind ever engages in. Um, and I regret the fact that we don't have a debate in the United Kingdom about the intrinsic value of cooperation between nations, which is mainly built on the basis of trading relationships but which goes far further than that and goes deep into our human psyche. Because, you know, what something that is, you talk to any psychologist about this, something that is exotic is also erotic in a sense. That's why you get so many cross-border marriages. <laughs> this, is, this is the future of the European Union. Isn't it? More than one marriage in every six now is between people who hold different passports. In the future, you're creating a European Union. As, as somebody once put it, but in a different context, you cannot turn fish soup back into an aquarium. You know, um, and, and the case for building Europe is, is all to do with this, is all to do with bringing people together. Um, that is something that I think is understood by the younger generation in the United Kingdom, who voted to stay within the European Union, not necessarily for economic reasons. They voted to stay within the European Union because partly it's second nature, they've grown up with it, but partly they see it as enhancing their freedom to move and to engage with others. And that is perhaps the greatest sign of hope that we have for the future of the United Kingdom, and I hope it applies not only in the UK, but right across the continent. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sir Graham. I have a question concerning Ireland again. I think it, it's quite interesting that um, also it's honestly something in favor of the European Commission. There are two administrations which are really well prepared to all this process. I mean, the British administration is completely hopeless, at least the politicians. They do not listen to what the so called mandarins or the, or the Sir Humphreys perhaps uh, wanted to tell them. But those who are prepared is the, the team of, of Barnier, the great people, clear people like, like we. The colleagues, perhaps, yet. and the other is the Irish diplomacy because the Irish are prepared because it, it's, it's a question really uh, uh, continuing what you say of, of but not of life and death but a uh, question of whether there, there could be war and at least uh, serious troubles again. Now, the question uh, a bit uh, speculative in case now uh, we are on the slippery slope to, to a dirty or, or negative Brexit, which is because in between I do not see many solutions. Uh, do you think the situation in Ireland, especially in Northern Ireland, can develop to a, to a uh, situation where uh, there will be more, more voices in favor of uh, the reunification of Ireland? Because uh, according to, and I read it even, how I understand the Good Friday Agreement, there is the, uh, there's the legitimate claim recognized by London, let's call it, that in case there is a, a movement, and also a demographic movement in, in Northern Ireland where we are nearly uh, on air, if there is a, a situation, then I understand that can be the claim of the Republicans within Northern Ireland and perhaps the rest of this nice island to have also a referendum. And then speculation again for explaining you, as far as I understand what they write about opinion polls, and every opinion poll can be right or wrong. There is at the moment not so much a mood, in, even in Northern Ireland, in favour of a reunification, which means it seems it seems that uh, perhaps uh, one quarter or twenty percent or one quarter of the Northern Irish population would be in favour of reunification, which means if I make my, my little 
chemistry and, and, and speculation. That certainly what the uh, Protestant think we can uh, believe, but also of the 47 or 48 percent of, of Catholic population, there is not an overall enthusiastic mood, as far as I understand, but this we can discuss. Do you think if this speculative uh, thing, what I say, is, is correct, do you think that this can, can move, that, for instance, by a, a uh, foreseeable rapid deterioration in the next two or three years uh, of, of the situation in the United Kingdom and especially in the fragile Northern Ireland uh, context where the economy is much more dependent from, from transfers from London? Uh, do you think that then there, there can be some pressure within Northern Ireland, even very speculative, that those who uh, feel close to the, the Protestant population will perhaps develop and say now what the Irish Republic has from the beginning uh, has not was not constructed for being only a, a one religion country. The Irish Republic in theory is was always open to Protestants also and the process of, of, of uh, loss of influence of, of all churches, of all Christian churches especially in Ireland, is so dramatic that perhaps there could be people in Northern Ireland who so far were on the Protestant side that they would say, now in simple terms, I'm not afraid of, of the reunification. I could imagine to be a, a, a citizen of, of the United Ireland because uh, uh, it, it's not so funny to, to be a member of a, let's say, impoverished United Kingdom. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I have the disadvantage of not being an historian, um, although I tend to the view that we might have prevented the breakup of Ireland um, at Mr. Gladstone's proposals in the Parliament of 1882 being accepted. Um, but, but we are where we are. Um, what is clear is that in the referendum campaign, while the Catholic community in Northern Ireland was pretty much united behind staying within the European Union, the Protestant community was divided. And interest, one interesting thing about the position of the Democratic Unionist Party um, in <coughs> preventing Theresa May reaching uh, her, the end of her pleasant dinner with John claude Juncker uh, last week was that Arlene Foster, the leader of the DUP, probably doesn't have, in fact certainly doesn't have the support of all of the people who would normally vote for her party. I think there is a growing number of people in Northern Ireland who see the advantages of a United Ireland, but I think the weakness in any th thoughts about, you know, some reunification is not looking at the Republic. And I should think the last thing that the Republic wants at the moment is a United Ireland. Uh, they simply don't want to take on the problem in Northern Ireland. One might almost say, and I apologize to anyone here who may be from Northern Ireland, who can blame them? <laughs> but this is similar to what was a mood in parts of Western Germany before reunification. <laughs> okay, last question, maybe. Hello. Um, my question is actually well, it's a question slash observation. And it's about what you were talking about earlier, that actually the main value of the European Union at the very basic level is not really in the economics per se, but in the fact that it's a framework that enables us to work together so we avoid self-destruction, basically. Um, but I was thinking about something. Uh, there seems to be, even leaving aside questions of the British psyche or the specifics of the British situation, there seems to be, to me at least, a lot more tribalism now everywhere. And um, so cooperation as a whole in general, um, if you also look at the political situation in the States, etc., etc., seems to be a little bit under threat. And I was wondering what you think about that in relation to the fact that I think globally, well, just looking at the Western world, um, from 2008 onwards, we seem to live in economies where more and more people join the ranks of the losers of the game. And these people are not going to be predisposed, I think, for cooperation when they, when they perceive that there's fewer, uh, fewer resources to go around or that the, yeah, that the pie is getting smaller. And, um, you know, you, you had the whole debate about competition within Britain in the, in the UK. 
I guess to, to sum up my question is um, what can we do, leaving aside questions of the British psyche and Brexit specifically, what can we do in politics in general to rebalance the situation a little bit? Because personally, I think if more and more people will continue to, be, to become losers in the game, we will reach a very, very unstable and dangerous situation because there will be less and less appetite for cooperation. Thank you. What you've touched on is something that J.K. Galbraith identified in either the late 1980s or the early 1990s. He wrote a book called The Culture of Contentment. And it was all about how government is done for what he then described as the 80% who did reasonably well, ignoring the 20% who did badly. But if you go through a major recession, as we have done, then of course that 20% grows substantially. And I think there is no doubt that inequality of wealth and income, which is a continuing social and economic weakness in the United Kingdom, is undermining any attempt to build a consensus on the future of the country. And it helps to explain why the country voted for Brexit, even if, ironically, the position of those worst off is likely to be even worse off as a result of Brexit. And I think that is actually a weakness in many of our societies um, in, in Western Europe, quite possibly beyond um, at the moment. And, you know, unless we can overcome that, then we will never stop this tendency to tribalism. And, you know, often in politics, it's mood, atmosphere that counts. And I think one of the things that's happened in the United Kingdom is that the romance of independence has become more powerful than the truth of unity. And that is one of the reasons why we're finding it so difficult to keep the United Kingdom in the European.